adjacent segment disease, thoracic spine. This patient has a very complex spine history. I'll go into more detail later. But for right now, looking at the MRI, you can see the spinal cord is this gray thing right here. And just above the fusion, it's getting crushed in this area, which is the T9, T10 area. You can actually see a T2 signal change in the cord right there, the white thing. So I'm going to do a laminectomy back here and unroof the spinal cord and get the pressure off the spinal cord. That's what we're doing today. Now this patient has a prior fusion, so we're scrolling through the MRI so you can see it. Um, and they have two fractures. So let me show you the fractures. One is here, and there's kyphoplasty material. Here's the other kyphoplasty material. That's the black stuff in the bone. So we're talking about unpinching the spine, basically the two vertebrae above the uh, fractures. So. That's going to be your T9 and T10, OK? So we can take the uh, camera off of them, and you can put it onto the patient, if you'd like. And we're going to, Dr. Patel has already opened the back. And we're going to be uh, exposing the spine to do um, the laminectomy, OK, for decompression. So I need a skin knife. Now we've already opened the top part of the incision. I didn't want to open the bottom yet until I was here to help out. The bottom area, obviously, is the part of the where there's scar tissue from his prior surgery. Now, the patient um, injured his back originally in a work-related injury and uh, had surgery elsewhere. And then he came to me, and I did a, a fusion on him. And he was doing fantastic for a while, but then started to go downhill. And what was going downhill was his legs. He was losing function in his legs. And he, he was losing balance, he was losing strength, he was losing function. And it wasn't long before the legs were just giving out on him completely. And he was falling. So now he's using, unfortunately, a, a wheeled walker to keep himself from falling. So what's unique about this surgery for the viewers is this is not a, a virgin case. We call virgin case meaning a new case. This is a, a revision, meaning we have to go back in. And uh, th in this case, not where I operated, but just next to it. So the, 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 the two uh, bones or spaces, disc spaces above my old surgery is where we need to be. All right, I need a smaller cup. So we've got the back open. Our patient is laying down on their belly. And you can see the screw here from the old surgery. And now, normally, I, when I do surgeries like this, I go pretty lateral. Let's just verify. Do we have, that's our x-ray picture there? So we've got our screw at the level above the kyphoplasty. And based on the MRI, this is the level and the one above it, really. It's more T10, T11, right? Where we need to focus. Let's go back to that MRI and scroll it for me. You don't need to go back, Sean. I want you to stay on the field. But I just want to make sure we're doing everything right. So kyphoplasty is there. And keep going. Keep going. Screw is there and back. Back. Yes, keep going and stop. Uh-huh. So it's at the level of the screw plus above it. So pretty much exactly where we are. Just It's always good to check, recheck, check, recheck um, your levels, OK? So I know here there's still a spinous process from the last surgery. So we were anchoring. And look, things are fusing here, which looks good. 
from his last surgery. So the hard part of this is gonna be all the scar tissue here. We need a, Dr. Patel has done a wonderful job higher up, but I didn't want him doing this area by himself without my assistance. So he stopped and I got involved and here we are. So, suck please. The, uh, the tissues after you've done spine surgery back here, the tissues are always gonna be scarred and you can see the muscles are well preserved but there's still scar tissue suck here and we don't have to get out as far lateral as we have in the past because we were doing a fusion because we're not fusing today we're just doing a decompression So what I want to do is basically get us lateral enough to do what's called a laminectomy, but we're not fusing. I don't want to have to fuse up here. I just want to decompress. Now, I talked to the patient at length before surgery, and we talked that maybe he will need a fusion at some point, you know? But for right now, he doesn't need a fusion up here. He just needs a decompression because he's getting his nerves pinched very badly. And so my goal is, on, is a decompression. It's not stabilization. It's not reconstruction. So surgeons that do spine surgery have usually three goals. Decompress means get the pressure off the nerves. Reconstruct means fix the alignment of the spine and stabilize means, you know, to make the spine stable so patients don't have pain or neurological compromise after surgery. So I am uh, here to do a decompression and we're not realigning and we're not stabilizing because the spine I think is going to be stable enough. Now part of this patient's problem is that they, uh, they have osteoporosis and they have uh, weak bones. So less is always more when it comes to patients with metabolic bone diseases like osteoporosis. Um, fusing them is hard to do because their bone quality is not good because the bone is sick. The bone is unhealthy. It doesn't, it doesn't act like normal bone. It doesn't get hard and strong, you know, after surgery and fuse nicely. So, you know, whenever you can avoid fusion in a patient, you want to avoid it. In this patient, I think we can get away with it. That's what I told him ahead of time. So, I expect that to be the case. Now, that said, I have my entire fusion team on standby here at the center. And for those of you who have never watched these surgeries before, all of our surgeries are done outpatient here at Duke Spine. We don't do any inpatient surgery. We don't take patients to the hospital. That's better to do outpatient surgery, in case you were wondering. Why? Hospitals are places where really sick people go. And that's people with infections, people with complications, complicated medical conditions. My patients are, are safe and healthy for the most part when they come and have their surgery done. Pretty cool, huh? All right. So, um, this should be the levels we're treating here and here. Once again, there's some scar tissue here. Save the bone just in case we need it. I don't expect to fuse. Now I'm starting what's called a laminectomy. And, and I'm going to look at the MRI one more time because as a spine surgeon, it's impossible to tell what level you're at because all the bones look the same except for a couple of, a couple of exceptions in the spine. One of them is C1, C2, T1, 
I mean, you can usually count where you are based on those things uh, and the sacrum. But maybe T12 L1 junction because of the rib. But I wouldn't count on it. All right. So let's see. Scroll side, side. Side, side, side. There's the screw. Now go back and stop. All right. So right where the screw is, above it and below it, basically, is what needs to be decompressed. So we need to go a little bit down below the screw. Yep, so here. I'm going to open all that and decompress it. That looks like spinous process, huh? And the trick here, I mean, this is difficult because it's an area that's already had surgery. But we want to look at all the, the muscles have re-adhered to the spine, which is good. But we want to pull and dissect under the muscle and get it off the bone. Okay, That's what we want to do. And there's a rod there, too. So that way I can get the bone out of here because it's the bone that we're trying to remove. It's called a laminectomy. Is that okay? Huh? Everything okay, doctor? So, I have no feed from your head cam, Dr. Duke, and the phone in the OR is not answering. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I've lost the feed from your head cam, and the phone oh. in the OR is not working. We need a feed for the head cam. Back oh. on. How's our waveforms on the monitoring? So we're monitoring this patient's spinal cord. Yeah. Yeah. This patient is has their spinal cord squashed. That's what we're here to fix. So they're myelopathic. He's losing strength in his legs, losing feeling. Uh, I checked on him this morning before surgery and definitely some bladder issues going on. He's losing control of the bladder. So this surgery is kind of an urgent thing because when you start losing strength in your legs, you start losing feeling uh, from your spinal cord getting crushed. It's very bad. We call it myelopathy, myelopathy. Mylopathy. Pathic means um, abnormality or disease of. Mylo is the spinal cord. So disease of the spinal cord. That's really what we're dealing with. There's the spinal cord right there. You see it? Right there. So it's kind of a scarred mess, but we're going to get this done. All right. Um, I'll need curettes and all that stuff in a moment, right? There's some scar tissue there. All right, uh, I may want the drill now. Remember, we're not going wide, folks, like I do with I do a fusion. We're just going narrow. It's called a laminectomy for amenotomy. I don't want to get out in the pars. I don't want to take the pars out. I just want to take the lamina, spinous process, and then I want to suck, I want to undercut, get in the foramen and open it up. So there's the spinal cord right there. Let's be careful, there's a little bit of fat actually, just above the spinal cord. But, you know, in the thoracic spine, everything's a bit narrow because um, and I may just do an onlay fusion here. 
So let's clean that bone. We're going to go ahead and fuse, but not with instrumentation. I'm just going to do an onlay. Unless I have, I, I think things are stable enough that I can get an onlay fusion. I need you to suck here. Yeah, don't worry about that. Let's get some gel foam. So an onlay fusion, folks, is the original fusion of all time. It's where the surgeon puts bone down on top of the spine and hopes and prays that it fuses. It's a non-instrumented fusion, meaning we don't put screws and rods to support the fusion. So the likelihood of fusion goes down without instrumentation. But then the risk of complication, suckles, goes up with instrumentation. So, you know, it's one of those things that you have to weigh in your mind. Now, if his spine was just falling apart up here, then I would definitely be putting hardware. I need you to suck here so I can see what I've got. Yeah. That makes sense. Please don't ruin the sucker if you can. Try to figure out my pattern of movement. I'm dig drilling a trough. Suck here. Let's see, gel foam, throw on it. A bipolar, just give me a bipolar. There's a little vein on the outside that I'm gonna see if I can bipolar it. Pain in the butt. So here, more volume. Get it? There, see? That worked. That's what we talked about this last week when I was talking about hemostasis or bleeding control. You gotta know where the bleeding comes from to be able to control it. If you don't know where the bleeding comes from, you're not going to be able to control it. So there are epidural veins to bleed. There's diploic bone. I need you to suck the bone dust so I can see what I'm doing here. This is a lamina. And again, I'm keeping my laminectomy narrow. Suck. And this is all, god damn it, Patel, come on. You know my movement. Suck here. This is going to be the bottom of the lamina. Yeah, as a surgeon, if you want to do a good job, you got to know the anatomy. Otherwise, you get into trouble right quick. And there's a lot of spine surgeons who don't understand the anatomy. I'm telling you, it's shameful. You never suspect it. Suck. All right, now. So. What is that? A little bit of scar tissue? Yeah, maybe the spinal cord. Let me see. I'm coming towards you. All right. Probably the best thing to do at this point is let's go up here where we know there's normal anatomy. And I'll put some, uh, nope, we don't need that. Let's put, we're not going to crack anything. Put some gel foam there. We've got probably another uh, 45 minutes. We'll be closing. We'll close. I should be done with the decompression and onlay fusion. Am I going to put a drain? I don't know. I, I'm, it's kind of at the on the border. So just so everyone can see, I want you guys to see this. All right, I'm going to go in there with a, a Woody and a K2. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> So folks, just so we understand, this is the revision surgery. I've already done a massive fusion on this patient up to T11. That's what that screw is, the top screw. And I want you to look here. This is muscle that we just dissected off the spine. It's never been touched before. Look how beautiful beefy red it is. And here is scar tissue that stuck the muscle back to the bone after the last surgery. And you can see it ends right here. Just an interesting point. I need a Woody and I need a Kerosene too. So we're here in the thoracic. Remember, we can't we can't uh, get into there and push on the cord, okay, Patel? So I'm gonna get my Kerosene in. Wipe. Don't worry about the other bone right now. So I'm I'm doing what's called a laminectomy. I'm right above the spinal cord. There's a little bit of vein. I'm gonna come in here where your sucker is, so. I'll need a Kerosene three next. 
And this is where that stenosis is. This is kind of the top of it. This is a three? You sure? A big jump between two and three. That does almost looks like a four, but I'll take your word for it. All right, so take, take, take. It's important to understand that I am starting at the normal area of vertebrae. Why? Because there's less likely to be scar tissue here. And scar tissue can hold the dura or spinal cord um, to the bone that's, that we're trying to remove. So it makes the anatomy abnormal. You good? Yeah, we're okay. It's weird. Karis and grab my glove. So you want to find a plane between the bone and the spinal cord. That's the key. And scar tissue will make that plane disappear. Luis, my leg is banging on, and I know it's probably the best you can do, the arm board. Well, what do you, I don't understand what that means. Got it, got it, all right. Yep, understood. Now, that's interesting. Suck here. Uh huh. Large bite. This is all ligamentum flavum. It's just hypertrophy. Let me have a woody. So there's a little bit of epidural fat here where Patel is sucking. But what I really need, I need you to suck while I work so I can see. All right, probably the best thing is gonna be come from bottom to top. So let's get that out. Um, large bite. This is just some scar tissue we don't need. It's getting in the way. So I am trying to figure out the best, safest way, take that drill, to clean out this space called a laminectomy where the lamina is. Suck here. And what I mean by best is safest for the patient. Because this is the spinal cord is just under here. We don't want to injure it. So, let me have that. What is all this curly cue? Looks like a french fry. Please get this out of the way. You should never have that many curls in your suction line. That's just, I can't even tell you what that is. I'm using loops, which are magnifying lenses. They help me see better. Would it be okay to use a, a microscope? Sure. No, nothing wrong with that. But I don't feel I need the microscope. And most surgeons would not use a microscope for this. That's the inner cortical bone right there. I need to get through that to be able to start getting rid of some of this inner lamina. Typically when you get through the diploic bone, you'll see a little bit of epidural bleeding. Harrison two. The trick is you wanna leave a little bit of bone just so you can grab onto something and poke, poke, bite it out. Otherwise, you're gonna have a hard time removing it. Now if you just have ligament to bite, you want to leave like a little eggshell. Once again, this is called a laminectomy. There's the spinal cord. I'm trying to just keep staying just above 
the spinal cord. It's kind of scarred on the surface. It doesn't have its characteristic beautiful white appearance because it's scarred up a bit from prior surgery. The reason it gets a little scarring is you get a little bleeding from the surgery. And the other reason is you get some inflammation from the herniated discs and the, and the facet joints. And it gets onto the, onto the spinal cord. See, the facet is right here. And so they get really inflamed, uh, facet joint arthritis. And that inflammation gets right onto the spinal cord. So we're doing our laminectomy. Let me have a three. Damn it, that thing keeps grabbing my glove. You want me? You want me? No, it's the kerosene. It's weird. I've, I've never had a kerosene bite my glove like that. I mean, that one's not biting my glove. Is there some separation going on? On the mechanism, on the gear? See the spinal cord there, folks, right there? I just want to look. I want you to look at it. It's it's biting like right through here somewhere. So this one's fine. Oh, okay, good. The other one is the one that was okay. biting. Yeah. Do you have an extra carrot here on the field? No, no, I I don't have another one. So I'm getting up here at the top of the lamina, and that's what? And that's the junction between one and the other. Okay. So I have a lamina here, and I got a lamina here. And this is the junction. Look at all that hypertrophied uh, ligamentum flavum. Help me. Don't push down at all. Because it's not the lumbar spine. Look at all that thickened. This is what was pinching on the MRI. I forgot to show you. In the back of the spinal cord, right here, is ligament that's pushing in to the spinal cord. It's called a, cr a double crush. We call it a double crush. And it just means it was crushing the spinal cord from the front and the back. So you got a disc herniation, bone spurs in the front, and you've got ligament, this ligament right here, thick end buckling, pushing on the spinal cord in the back. Oh yeah, and that ligament is also inflamed. And that causes the redness you're seeing on the spinal cord. We have a question. Question. One of our viewers is wondering, can a condition like this that you're treating cause drop foot? No, we're not treating drop foot. We're treating uh, paralysis. This patient was going paralyzed. So it's not just one side. That, a drop foot usually is one side that's affected. This patient, um, her, both of his legs were going weak. When you have a spinal cord compression, usually, and it can be on one side, but usually, it affects both legs. So this patient was losing his ability to walk. He was getting weak in his legs. He couldn't stand. He's using a really wheeled walker. Like a really, we just see, he's losing his ability to walk. He's getting weaker and weaker and weaker in his legs. More wo wobbly. So he also was starting to lose the control of his bladder. So your ability to control your bladder comes from the sensation you're feeling from your bladder. It travels right up the spinal cord to the brain. And uh, there are parts of your brain that say, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee. Well, when you, let me have a Woody. When you uh, have compression of the spinal cord, those signals don't get to the brain. And you can just suddenly have to pee. And, uh, and you gotta run to the bathroom or you won't make it. And then of course, if you don't get the fix, then, then you're gonna, it's gonna get worse. Pretty soon you'll just be peeing on your own self, peeing in your pants, you won't even know it. You just bladder releases. All right, we're done with the laminectomy up here, but I gotta go further south. And you can see the spinal cord down there, it's been decompressed. Let me see you, Dr. Patel. So now we got, the fun issue of a scarring, scarring of the spinal cord to the bone, which is like, we don't want that. 
obviously, because that makes it a lot harder to take this out. I need a straight curette, actually an angled curette. Yes, sir. Small. No down pressure. Have you seen any improvement yet in the waveforms? I need you to suck for me. So an angle curette is a beautiful tool. It allows the surgeon to free up uh, the dura. Let me have a, a kerosene three. Yes, sir. I've done a few millimeters, so I'm going to go in there and remove the shelf of bone. You can see the shelf of bone down there, right? That's a that's a two millimeter. I want a three. I may need the two, but I want to try a three first. So what you're supposed to be doing is showing me my target, not blocking my target. So we have an improvement in the SSEPs. Let me have a two. So you're seeing an improvement. Yes, sir, I am. I can't get in there. Twenty percent on the left, forty percent improvement on the right. Yes, sir. That's fantastic. Now that's four four Yeah, I understand. All right, gel foam. Look at, please, look at the Dura, guys. Just look at the difference. It's pretty crazy, huh? I mean, you can see right here, it's pretty much white, right? And right here, it's pretty much red. That's from the compression and the inflammation from those facet joints. Let me, let me try to open this a little more first. Let me have a, let me have a Woody and then an angle curette. We have to be really careful not to push down on the spinal cord. A little bit is okay, a lot of it is not okay. No. You won't see orthopedic surgeons doing this. This is where they stop. Why? They're not trained to do this kind of work. This is a neurosurgeon's territory. And many won't even do this, so. You have a question? Yes, we do. I'm just taking this bone out, watch it, little piece by little piece. Like literally millimeter by millimeter. You, you do have a question? I'll be happy to take it. Yes, we have a viewer on Facebook who's wondering, do you use compression plates and locking screws? Do I use compression plates? We're not... Did he compression plates? Is that what he asked? Yes. So take that. We're not using any, let me have gel foam. We're not using any plates and screws today. These are old ones. Um, we're not putting new screws or plates in. We're not, we're not, suck please, we're not instrumenting this case. So we're just doing a decompression. We're just taking the pressure off the spinal cord. Um, we won't be doing any fusion, okay? So I just want you all to know that. When I do a fusion, I use screws and rods in this particular situation. We only use plates, suck here, in the neck, gently, 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 gently. Take. We only use plates in the neck. Now there are some surgeons that use plates in the, uh, they use plates in the um, lumbar spine, I don't. I don't do that. I really need to get through here. That's my goal, right here. Question is, what am I dealing with here? Take, call. Actually, let's have a, let's have a Woody and a Bovey. So I gotta figure out what I'm dealing with here. That's scar tissue. But the question is, am I lateral to the lamina? It looks like I am. Let me have a large bite for a second. It's a little bit of scar tissue there. Remember, these surgeries are, that we do open, like the one you had before, they're, uh, they do create scar tissue, Bobby. 
So it's best to avoid them. Um, in this, his case, he couldn't, but there's so many fusions being done nowadays where there's so, I mean, the, the surgery that I did before where this created this little bit of scar tissue, it looks like a lot, but it's not a lot of scar tissue. But that surgery that I did before um, was very delicate, but still you can see scar tissue is made. It's still created. So, yeah, I've got to figure out where we are. Suck. I'm trying to do that. I think that's just scar tissue there. Question is, where's the lamina? Right? And I got to drill down on that lamina. And I just, the anatomy is eluding me. Let me see. I don't know if I, some of it was removed or just rotated. <clears throat> but this is bone. So I know I need to remove this bone here at least in order to get further north so I have to bridge this gap right here that's where there's some compression and to do that I need I need to get rid of some of this bone this is the lamina we're doing a laminectomy suck so obviously the bottom of here is going to be the spinal cord, which I don't want to get into. In case you're wondering what get into means, it means the same thing you think it means. Large bite. It means enter it. We don't want to enter the spinal cord ever, unless we're taking a tumor out of the spinal cord, which we're not doing today. We're just unpinching it from the back. So getting into it is not something we envision happening today. So this is just the laminectomy, but it's a bit of a weird lamina. But if I could just get in underneath, suck, irrigate. If I could just create a, a little entrance above the dura right here, then I could come across this thick wad of tissue which is the junction between the two lamina. That's what we're dealing with here, suck. So I'm excavating. It's kind of hard for you all to tell because you don't have a, a 3D view. But I'm excavating here. And this is all bone, I can feel it. Bone and ligament right there. Gentle, gentle. Suck here, suck here. You have a narrow biter. A narrow biter. A large, a narrow bite. Look, Sean, suck here. Suck here. I need to see. You're not sucking enough. There you go. That looks like the flow is bone. So a narrow bite has a narrower mouth can bite these troughs a little better in the thoracic region. That was beautiful. You see that? All right, so we're making some progress. Right here is my area of concern. That's the last pinched area. If I could just get through here safely and do our laminectomy right here. Sweet Jesus, let me have that. I know you're doing your best, but I've got to be able to see. So it's probably better if I take over for a few minutes. All right, take that. All right, let's see here. Let me have an angle curette. This is the last area we have to fix and then we're done. So I just need to try to free up the dura without creating any problems.
fake. Let me have a Kerosin too. Fake. Be real careful of that little island. I'm going to take it out. Man, that is an abnormal facet. Hmm. All right. Let me have a sucker. How's our blood pressure? Looks like he's... All right, it's a little too high. Anytime you go over 110, people start bleeding spontaneously. Let me, uh, let me have a Woody. I may need to take a little bit more from Patel's side. I think that's what I'm going to have to do. Let me have a sure. no straight curette, straight small. Yeah. So, I'm right above the spinal cord, and I feel like the spinal cord is sticking here to the bottom of the lamina. So I can't just bite the lamina off unless I want to get a spinal cord injury, kerosene three, which I don't. So you have to first separate the dura from the under from the bottom of the lamina. Let me have a two. Yes, sir. It's always better to use a bigger kerosene when you can because there's less likely you're going to trap the dura in that kerosene's teeth. Is that bigger? Huh? Bigger. bigger. Bigger's better. However, you have to balance it with the foot plate. Because right. the foot plate's bigger. Let me have an angle curette. Yes, so the foot plate's bigger, <clears throat> so you push down on the dura more. So you have to balance pushing down on the dura with um, biting the dura. Uh, so much scar tissue here. And this is not from the prior surgery. This is actually from the, uh, that gives you an idea of the force I have to use here. This is from the uh, uh, arthritis. Th these are the facets and they're so arthritic from his um, degenerative spine. Wow. So what I'm doing is I'm just detaching. The, the inflammation from the facets has scarred the spinal cord, basically, to those facets. And I'm trying to free it up so I can bite it out. What's wrong, Patel? Huh? Let me have a drill. Take this, somebody. Show me here. Gentle, gentle. I'm gonna drill this wall just a little bit. I need another millimeter. It's always better to drill less and then take more later if you need it. But the more I take, the more likely I create instability. Kerosin two. <clears throat> so uh, for the surgeon, it's a balance between Help me. I can't see here. See, all this is what I freed up. Beautiful. Kerosene 3. It's a balance between removing bone to unpinch the nerve or spinal cord versus destabilizing the spine. Oh, yeah. That's a good bite. That's a good bite. So... A lot of spine surgeons don't understand that balance. And they just go crazy and take, 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 take. Narrow. Take bone, take ligament, take joint. And that causes the, the patient to be unstable after surgery, like Tiger Woods, for example. If the surgeons were more careful on his first surgery, he could have had a successful surgery the first time and not come back and had more and then eventually a fusion. <clears throat> 
but you have to do it right, and it's not easy to do it right. It's not easy for most doctors because they don't know how to do it right. That's the problem. Only a few of us truly understand how to do it right. It's up here. I need to see. Damn, look at that. Oh, yeah, finally. Not yet. Sweet Jesus. That is ugly. All right, Kerrison. Yeah. More volume? A little bit. Look at that thick ligament. That was crushing the spinal cord. It's not normal. It's hypertrophy. And now we're unpinching. This is good. That's enough. I need to feel the plane. Uh, don't push it down. So for those of you who don't know what I'm doing, I'm actually feeling with the instrument. I'm feeling with this foot plate. I can literally feel it sliding or not sliding. And you want it sliding. Sliding means you're in an area between the dura and the ligament. Take suction. You may have a curette. Angled, angled. Almost done. Wow, that's so scarred down. Pituitary. Pituitary, please. Just give me a pituitary. I'll tell you what I want. I'll make whatever you give me work. Sweet Jesus, look at that. This is what's crushing the spinal cord from the back. And what I really want is to get in here. Stop. Come out. Right here. Because if I can get in there, let me have a uh, narrow bite. Then I can come up from the bottom up, which is always better in a laminectomy. Come from the bottom up. Take. I'm going to try to drill that. We have another Take question. This. Sure, drill. We have a Facebook viewer wondering, can you get rid of arthritis while you're in there? I didn't hear what they said. You need one sucker here. Forget about the bone, that stuff. You need one sucker here so the blood doesn't drain down to here. One sucker here and one sucker sweeping up top, right here. What was the question? Can you get rid of the arthritis while you're in there? Question? I couldn't understand what he's saying. Can you get rid of arthritis? Rid of arthritis? Yeah. With the surgery. With this surgery? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yes, you can. Any joint replacement surgery and most fusions can get rid of arthritis. Arthritis is inflammation of a joint. Tuck. I feel like that's it right there, huh? Harrison 2. Can you tell? Are we through? Oh, yeah? Please? And this is deep. Huh? No? Drill? Incredible, huh? Question is, are we off too much to the side? I mean, I see the cord here, but it doesn't look like it. Arthritis is a disease of a joint. You get rid of the joint, you get rid of the disease. It's that simple. Well, that's really interesting. I, I need to see. I mean, 
How is it we haven't broken through yet? You know? I've been a miner for a heart of gold. seem like it. Two cherry. I've drilled the bone down to an eggshell. That's the top of the lamina right there. You can see all this ligament just sitting there. And that's what's digging in to the spinal cord, this ligament. So I think I might be okay because I went, I, I normally like to get this stuff from bottom up, cutting cutting through that junction, right where the facets are on the side, I like to go up, because you get onto the dura here in that plane, and you just bite, 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 and then bite, 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 and you're golden. There's some serious crushing going on though. You can't really appreciate it from where you are, but that's a spinal cord. And then way down here is where the lamina is. So I gotta, it's like digging in. This is the last part that we need to unpinch. Just studying the anatomy carefully before I start working. I want to make sure I understand it. I really want to come from down there, so I'm going to try one last time, right here. See if I can break through. I must have an eggshell right there. It seems like I'm through. It's hard to tell. I think I'm through right there. The problem is this is the best place to break through, but into the epidural space, but it's also the most dangerous because that's where the cord is compressed the most. But it's also where there's no ligament. See, there's no ligament at the top of the lamina. It attaches to the very top, but there's no ligament like in the top half on the dura. So it's a clean area and that's ligaments usually what sticks the bottom of the bone to the spinal cord. I think that's through right there. That looks like it. Y'all see that? That little window I created? Kerosene too. You just need it big enough to get your smallest kerosene in. That's the dura. Please. Hey, what's going on? Move your hands. Putting a blanket on the patient? Come on, Patel. All right, that's fine. What's his temperature? Temperature? How is that possible? You have an esophageal temperature probe? Okay. We have the esophageal probe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> All right, this is it, folks. Uh, 10 more minutes of decompression, and then the arthrodesis part's easy. And then I'm starting to close, yeah. We're just about done. This is going really well. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Luis. Do you tell everybody, Dr. Paz, what your name stands for? Take it. Yes. Nice job. Kerosene yes. 3. Just about Peace. done. Peace. So just I'm just working down here underneath this lamina. No. Beautiful. Spinal cord is being decompressed beautifully. 
this is part easy. So I'm very happy. Looks good there. We just need to look across this area right here. Yes, looking good. I'm gonna open this up just to the side a little bit. Show me. This is all thickened ligamentum flavum, the yellow stuff I'm biting out, and some bone. The bone really isn't the problem. It's this thickened ligament, which still is on my side. I'll show you. You can see it. Can you guys see that okay? See that thing right there of ligament? And that's just crushing the spinal cord. So I'm gonna come on this side and get under it. There you go. And bite it out. One little bit at a time. It's a three millimeter foot plate, so we're getting about th three millimeters a time. Now notice, Okay, I don't expect that to happen, but notice the training and the technique. When I lose control, so to speak, I'm not losing control of the instrument, but when it moves in a way that I don't want it to, it moves up and out. It doesn't move down towards the spinal cord. And that's something you have to train yourself as a neurosurgeon. We're trained to, when we have moments like that where you suddenly lose resistance to the instrument, like the resistance you're working in suddenly moves, you go up and out. So it's something you have to literally consciously think about. Look at how the spinal cord was just getting crushed right there. Isn't that cool? Well, we're just about done. We're 95% done with the decompression. How are our waveforms looking? All right, so you got a 20 and a what, 40, 20%, 40%? Man, look at that cord, just red. All right, uh, irrigation. Yeah, we're, we're almost totally decompressed. Let me have the angle curette. I want to make sure I'm not leaving anything. Anyway, this is the thoracic spinal cord, and we are at the T. This is in T11, so T11, some of T12, T10, T10, T11, T12. Right, beautiful. And again, it's just scarred down right here. Can you guys see okay, Sean? How good is yes. the view? It's very good. Right. I'm just underneath the, basically the facet called the lateral recess. I'm just medial to the pedicle of 11. Well, I've gotten into some of T9. So T9, T10, T11, T12. Just the top of T12. All right, let's just get a kerosene to... And I'm going to do a fusion as well, an onlay hopefully to stabilize it a little bit so we don't have to come back. But I'm not going to use screws and rods. Oh, that little bit left right there I got to get. It's kind of digging in on the side. I need you to get in there and suck for me. Take this. I need an angled curette. All right, let's go. Okay, good. What I'm looking for is right here. See how it's stuck down right there? and it's kind of pushing in. I need to get separation between the cord and that piece of bone so I can bite it out. If you don't get the separation you need first, you'll bite the dura and the spinal cord will come out with it. And that's really, really, really bad. Look at that. That's all facet hypertrophy. Kerosin two. You can see how it's digging in there, right? Patel can see it, but can the audience see it? Probably can. Okay. God, it's terrible. It's so deep. And some of this is rotational deformity. Scoliosis, just rotating that facet right in. 
right into the cord. This is how deformity causes neurological compromise. When you, you get it, it's not often. But the, the spine is twisted. Yeah. Almost had it. Pituitary narrow. Show me. Hallelujah. Oh, gentle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> nice. Very nice. All right. Let me. Uh, let me see. Looking good. Let me see. Uh, Oh, Woody. Remember, this is the thoracic spinal cord, so we don't want to get too, uh, too, we don't want to be a cowboy. And we don't want to be a cowgirl either, I mean. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean we don't want to be a cow anything. Let me have a straight curette. Just want to make sure. What, how long are these things? These are too long for this case. Those are you the put the long ones. No, those are actually the short. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Well, for thoracics, like a skinny guy like this, we need shorter uh, suckers. Okay. So let's get some. Yes, sir. Not that I want to do more of these cases, but I like to have everything perfect. Just about done. Let me have a kerosene three. Yes, That's just the last of that ligament right there off to the side that we want to get rid of. And we're going to be closing. You have suture closed? We have. And we have the bone graft? We have bone graft. I need to give me one second and I will. Take your time. Okay. Not right now. Any questions from our audience, Sean? None others currently. Huh? None others currently. Oh, yeah. By the way, you'll never see this surgery anywhere in the world done outpatient, except here. We're the only facility in the world that does this kind of surgery outpatient. As a matter of fact, every surgery you've ever watched at Duke Spine is outpatient. We don't have a hospital. We have an ambulatory surgery center in our clinic, and that's it. So we're doing surgeries that most spine surgeons are scared to do, in their, even in the hospital, and we do them outpatient. This patient will take an hour to recover and then go home. And by the way, his fusion that we did from L4 up to T11, T11 L4 fusion, that included osteotomies and derotation of his spine, massive surgery. We all did, we did it outpatient right here about, what, six months ago? Yeah, six months ago. So if you go back onto YouTube or Facebook, you'll, uh, back in September of 2020, you'll see it. All right, pretty much done. We've lost about 20 mils of blood and we're ready to close. We need to put, our bone graft. I, yeah. We used a lot of irrigation. Let me have the drill. We're going to decorticate, and then I'm going to pack some bone graft. And we'll be, we'll, we've already done most of the decorticating. We'll do a little more. Nah, it's just going to pack it right over there. I put a lot of gel foam, so I'll keep the bone graft. I don't need much, Luis. <clears throat> We're going to do an onlay fusion. Onlay fusion. T9 to T12. T9 to T12. Let's put a drain. We're, we're putting the bone graft right now. 
We got X pearl. We have We're gonna put the X pearl. We're gonna put a gram of vank. Maybe not a gram, half a gram. Irrigation. So suction. Just suck where you don't get the gel foam. We're gonna do irrigation. Bone graft. You do have some proper irrigation. Beta van. Beta is wonderful. It kills pretty much every microorganism except for one. Anybody know what that one is? Let's see who's super smart. Of course, I know it. Huh? Dr. Patel comes in with the prion. Yes. Nice. Prion disease, which you never want in your lifetime. Because your lifetime will be short. Very short. Mad cow disease, scrapey. Let me have the, yeah. When you decide, you don't want your bone graft crushing your spinal cord, so. I don't trust this piece, it's too chunky. Yeah, uh, bank. I need just half a gram. So bone graft in the lateral gutter. Keep the blood pressure, um, you know, around 90, 100. This is half a gram? Half a gram. Half a gram, good. is an antibiotic. We've not had, that's really half a gram? It looks like so much. Is it just half? Yes, You're sir. sure? Yes, sir. Okay, I believe you. You've got the x I need the drain while he does that. I'll do the drain. One of the things about these, thank God it closes, you worry about is uh, um, put the drain off to the side, always at the bottom. I have to go through the fascia. One of the things you worry about is can you bring the edges together, right? You don't want to puncture the spinal cord, so you want to aim under the fascia. Unfortunately, there's all that scar tissue because you want to come in the muscle. Do you have a, a smaller one, like a s uh, smaller hemostat, a mosquito? Uh, I may be able to get it if you don't. Okay. It's just so much scar tissue. I got it, I got it. You want to come out, for those of you that are surgeons, go. You want to come out, almost, sorry. Hold on. You got it? No, it's not enough, push it in. Deeper. Yeah. You want to come out under the fascia, is what I was trying to say. Really, there's no mosquito. Let's see if we can do it better. There we go. That will do it. We got it. Scissor. Uh-huh. We're going to use a drain, because it's a little, you know, more sanguinous than I'm happy with and right over the spinal cord. Just be, just be careful with that needle. All right, you got sutures? Yeah. We'll be closed in about 15 minutes. Okay. 15, one five. Yes, one five. Let me have a bovie. Yes, so I'm gonna hit up some of these little spots. It's the other thing about scar tissue is it always bleeds more than normal tissue. Now when you're dealing with muscle bleeding, always best to use a ray tech. We thought we're gonna start uh, closing. Yeah. What's wrong, Dr. Patel?
It is, because it's a scar tissue. It's not the scar muscle that will that will hurt the most. Yeah. It's gonna be the fresh freshly cut. So this stuff is not as important as up here. This will hurt more. So we wanna get the expo in that area the most. Is that the late is that the latest blood pressure? Okay, get a ray tech. At the end, you want it normal, right? I want it, no, in the recovery, I want it low. Oh, you want it low I want it 100, 105, at most 110. We don't want them to have develop a hematoma. Yeah, I mean, eventually we can start bringing it up, but I don't want it, I don't want them hitting 150, 160. So I need to figure out where these little bleeders are coming from. That's what I don't understand. If this pressure is normal, why are we getting some bleeding? Get me a fucking Raytec and a Bovi. Otherwise, we're never going to get closed. There. That's what I need you to do. I don't understand why we're getting pop-off right now at 92. That makes no sense. Something isn't right. You're sure about that blood pressure reading? Get down there. Did you cook these enough when you came in? If you don't cook them enough, then you're going to have bleeding on the way out. You're sure, right? All right. You're getting muscle contraction, which is good. Gentle, gentle. Don't wipe a lot. See, there's another one. A little bit of oozing is okay when you close a wound like this. You've got to drain. You're going to have the wound, the edges of the wound pressuring on each other. Should be good. Let's get the drain hooked up and let's close. Stitch. All right, so just like with a lumbar, you only close the fascia. You don't close the muscle. Yeah, stick around for a little bit to help me. I may need some help with the hemostasis. Look at that. What is, what is that? Oh, by the way, for those of you who don't know, here. These surgeries are all broadcast live. So you get to see. Have you gotten a reading yet? OK. You get to see, as the viewer, uh, everything that yeah, it's gone up. We're getting pop-up. I'm telling you, anything over 100, you're going to get spontaneous bleeding. We can't have that. You've got to get it down. So, um, I just give him... Why would you not use a antihypertensive? Hmm. I need I need suction on this fucking line right now, Luis. This is not sucking, so figure it out and get it working. Why is it is it sucking? I don't see it sucking. So these surgeries that we broadcast are live, meaning that when we have issues, you get to be part of it. And as a surgeon, I don't like having things deviate from the normal because I figured everything out over the years, exactly how to do everything perfect. I can't do it myself. I rely on my teammates, but they have to do their job right. Otherwise, 
we start having issues, like right now with some bleeding, blood pressure must be kept below 110. And, and not, you know, not with a sedative, yeah. with an antihypertensive, so that we can wake our patient up. So by getting the wound closed, it will help with hemostasis, but you want to make sure the big bleeders are taken care of before you close. I would change your Raytech to a clean one. So these surgeries, if they're not done perfect, then you get complications. And what I mean by perfect, I don't mean my part. I mean, my part's important, but I mean everybody, the assistant, the anesthesia, the nurse, everybody's gotta be paying attention, monitoring everything, making sure that we maintain the patient's critical, vital, you know, blood pressures and heart rate and everything is kept under tight control. Once you start letting things swing out of control, you get complications. So I'm a big proponent of consistently having your parameters and your technique, everything from positioning the patient. If you don't position the patient right, you can have nerve damage in their arms and elbows. You can have breakdown of skin, getting an ulcer. You can have access issues to to monitor their blood pressure, to monitor everything. You know, the, the pressure cuff may get pushed on and then you don't get a real blood pressure reading. So the IV could stop working and then you can't give them drugs to stay asleep. They start waking up during surgery, bad, all bad. So everything has to be monitored and controlled. And that's why I took these surgeries out of the hospital because my ability to control those parameters at the hospital was compromised. And it's not just mine, this is true for every surgeon. Even Dr. Patel knows what I'm talking about for pain management. The hospital used to be where they listened to the doctor and did what the doctor said. Because the doctor is the one who knows the most about how to do procedures, how to set the room up, how to staff properly, how to do everything properly. But then hospitals started thinking that they could do it better their way. And some hospitals are fantastic. Got no complaints with them. But others, they're always trying to cut corners and buy cheaper and have the you know cheap staff or cheap supplies or cheap equipment. And then when you start getting equipment and staff and supplies that don't do their job properly, then you start having bad results. You get you get swinging out um, <clears throat> your patients. All the parameters start to swing out of the norm. Okay, and that's not good. You know, if your blood pressure gets too low, your patient can have a heart attack, a stroke, kidney malfunction. If your blood pressure gets too high, you can have bleeding, you can have a stroke as well. I need a scissor. There's lots of potential bad, you have a scissor, go ahead. We have another question. Patel's got the scissor, yeah. A viewer on Facebook is wondering, what causes keloid scarring? Keloid scarring is a great question. That's a genetic thing. It has nothing to do with the surgeon. I need a pickup. Keloid scarring is the patient's own genes. You have a predisposition to forming large scars that basically grow over, up and over the edges of the wound. And that's not something the surgeons can stop. Now that said, I take closing very serious, even in a keloid patient, because you can make the keloid much worse if you don't close the skin properly. So the key to closing skin and avoiding ugly scars is to have all the tension off of the skin, the edges of the skin. You don't want, like, you know how you have to pull things together? If you use the skin to pull it together, then the tension will be on the skin. If you use the tissues under the skin to pull the wound together, like we do, 
which is the proper way, then there's no tension on the skin. So look where I'm grabbing. I'm grabbing the tissues under the skin. The skin is here where I'm grabbing, but I'm taking a bite underneath the skin. So there will be no tension on the actual skin itself. And that's, that's the key, is to get the tension of the sutures off the skin and get the skin skin tension to be zero. Look how the skin comes together there. It takes, it's not gonna take any pressure to hold it there. And we're gonna just put some staples in there in a minute. All right, Dr. Patel, I think we're good. If you wanted to take off at this point, I appreciate all your help. No, no problem, thank you. I think we're good. You'll be in the building, obviously, in case I need you. Yep. I need 10 more stitches at least, Luis. How many you got? We have, I believe, uh, six more after that one. I don't think that's enough. Let me just see. I'll tell you in a moment. I'll tell you in a moment. I don't think it's going to be enough, but let me see. You have six more. Let's get some music going. I need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, I need more than six. I usually put my stitches at this point about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half away from each other. Beautiful song. Since nobody's asking questions, crank up that music. That's all right. Facebook can kick us. How's our blood pressure? I like it. today. This is a patient who had a spinal fusion, long segment with reconstruction. Six months ago, he's developed now what's called adjacent segment disease. And adjacent segment disease just means that the segments, the vertebrae segments above or below your fusion have now degenerated and are causing symptoms. Now, adjacent segment degeneration is much more common than adjacent segment disease. And we make the distinction as degeneration is a radiographic finding, doesn't mean the patient has symptoms. So you do a fusion, you get an MRI a year later, and the discs are collapsing above or below the fusion. It doesn't mean the patient has symptoms from it. They could be asymptomatic, no back pain, no leg symptoms, no nothing. So that's adjacent segment degeneration. It's a radiographic finding. Disease means there's dysfunction and there's a problem and it needs to be fixed. So disease is less common than degeneration. And adjacent segment disease is, needs treatment. This patient had adjacent segment disease. Now, the average for spine surgeons doing fusions is somewhere around, probably around 25%, 10 to 25% in the literature, depending on whose studies you read and who you're looking at. But in my personal practice of 25 years now doing these surgeries, my rate of adjacent segment disease is about 1%. And I know that because I've studied it. I've re read my patients' charts and found that 1% of my fusions come back for another surgery or need another surgery at an adjacent segment. So. It's a pretty low number. And what do I attribute that to? I need a ray tech. I attribute that to primarily a good technique, but also I attribute it to treating all the levels that need to be treated. So one of the problems in spine surgery today is these spine surgeons will, will see a patient that has three bad discs or three bad segments. They're all causing symptoms. The surgeon only does one level fusion. All right, and that one level fusion leaves two untreated discs. Well, of course the patient says, I still have back pain after surgery, or neck pain, depends on what we're treating. And they come back and 
the surgeon sends them for shots and the surgeon sends them for conservative treatment. Oh, do some physiotherapy. And a year goes by and then they get another MRI and of course the levels that the surgeon didn't treat are worse. And so they're having a second surgery and then they call it adjacent segment disease. The problem is that was disease present the first surgery. The surgeon just never treated it. That is the number one reason in the community for adjacent segment disease. Now, you've all heard about adjacent segment disease and you've heard the reason is, you know, fusion wears down the joints above and below. Biomechanically, it makes sense. But that's not the reason. That's what I was taught in residency and in my meetings and everything I went to. But the truth is, is it's due to two things that are far more common. Under treatment with the first surgery and I just need one more. Phew. Yeah, for the drain. And the second reason, actually I need a scissor first. The second reason for it, it besides under treatment with the first surgery, with the index surgery, is the second reason is poor alignment. Poor alignment of the spine. So most surgeons, spine surgeons, don't understand how to align the spine properly. They conceptually on paper may understand what they need to do, but they can't do it. They don't know how to do it. And the key to doing it in the lumbar spine is what's called the Smith-Peterson osteotomy. Removing these abnormal joints, these facet joints, that are so hypertrophied and sclerotic that they really prevent the surgeon from putting the patient back in lordosis or correcting scoliosis. So the two deformities in the lumbar spine we're gonna talk about the lumbar spine because the lumbar spine is the most common place people have pain that need surgery, and it's the most common surgery done, lumbar, which is lower back. So there's two types of deformities that contribute to adjacent segment disease. One is kyphosis, actually there's three. There's kyphosis, there's scoliosis, which is twisting. So kyphosis is kinking forward, scoliosis is twisting to the side, and then there's listhesis. So those three deformities, if they're not corrected by your surgeon during your first surgery, they're gonna cause adjacent segment disease. You will be back. So the truth is, adjacent segment disease is not caused by biomechanical failure of adjacent segment. It's caused by poor operative technique during the first surgery, about 90% of the time. Now who's the first person to report this? Me. Have I done an analysis and collected data from all these other surgeons? No, it's not possible, you can't do that. There's HIPAA that prevents that. But that's been my observations for years of treating patients with adjacent segment disease from other surgeons and my own experience. And it's easy to prove, I just don't have residents and fellows to help me do the research. I'm, a, I'm basically at Duke Spine. I support myself and my team, and we do a little bit of research, but most everything is in my head. And they say, well, that's the worst kind of evidence, but no, I can promise you, if somebody looked at it, they'd see. The biggest problem is residual deformity after surgery that gets untreated, and um, untreating the proper number of levels, not treating all the levels that should be treated with the first surgery. Those are your two most common causes of adjacent segment disease. And somebody needs to publish it. I may someday, but I need a, I need a fellow to come work with me and publish it. So if you know anybody out there that wants to do a spine surgery, why are you leaving this crap laying around for me to get it on my fingers? Wet, dry, stapler, yeah, stapler. All right, so at this point, take a look at this skin, okay? There's, it's all coming together beautifully. So there's no tension on the skin, stapler, and then I'll take a wet, dry again. I need a stapler and then a wet, dry. Let's go, just pay attention. I know you wanna get your count done, but you gotta pay attention. So, I don't use AdSense, I just look at the incision carefully and I, I pull the incision apart where it needs to be pulled apart, push it together where it needs to be pushed together. 
Some people put too many staples. How's our blood pressure? Remember, the staples aren't going to hold the incision together. Is the drain sucking? Because yes. we're getting a lot of juice coming out. And beautiful. Where's my wet dry? Right right it's the wet? Yeah. It's not very wet. Yeah. All right, polysporin. All right, do you have any questions for me? Look how perfect that is. It's gorgeous. Polysporin. Right here, sir. Yeah. Never put it on like that. This is way too wide. Would you want to wear a diaper? This should be wiped. Always before you hand it to me. Come on. It's sloppy. This should be this wide. Look how wide it is. How wide is it? As wide as the staples. Okay? That's the proper way to do it. And then you take this and you put it on the back of an instrument and you hand it to me so I can put it right on the incision line. Okay? You know this stuff, Luis. Don't get sloppy on me. No, 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 no. Never an excuse for sloppiness. Never, never, never. I don't accept it, ever. Wipe that because I may need that for the tape, right? So don't put it down. Wipe it. After I said don't put it down, you didn't put it down. You put it down. Scissor. Again, see the blood? I don't want to put blood on a white, beautiful white something, okay? That's what the patient sees, that's what the family sees. They don't want to see fucking blood. Why do you think everybody in a hospital wears white? Clean, clean, clean. You think they're gonna come in with brown colored stuff? People will go crazy. There's a psychology to medicine part of the healing experience. You have to re respect it, okay? I didn't create it. That's something that was created hundreds of years ago. We have to respect that tradition. There's, there's a reason they took the time to figure that out. You understand? So respect the people that made that investment of time and effort. Okay, are we ready? I'm good here. I just need tape. So, who has the tape? It's a little too long. Why would you give me such a long piece? You guys, there's really honestly, in medicine, there's a right way to do everything. It's two pieces. See? It's magical. It's just you take the time to figure it out once, and you never have to think about it again. You just become a robot. And robot is good. Here, let me show you how I do. Let me just show you. Here, watch. Okay. Take it. Put it down. Like that. There. And then just like that. It'd be nice if I didn't have bloody gloves. hate this shit. I like the paper tape, but you know, this is nice because the patients don't sweat underneath this. And he's a sweaty guy. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. It's an occlusive dressing. It's not letting any of the outside world in, no bacteria. It's clean and white like it should be, and it's proper. It's not, it doesn't look like a hack job. All right, so questions, go ahead and type them up. I'll come answer them, and we got a, the next surgery will be a Duke laser disc repair. And I'll talk a little bit more about this surgery and why we did what we did today. I'm gonna call her EBL 25. No complications. I'll head over there now, Sean.
All right, everyone, thank you for joining us for the post-op Q&A. We have Dr. Duke in the room with us. We're about to bring up his face cam so he can talk to you a little bit about the surgery you just watched and answer any of your remaining questions. If you have any questions left for him, please type them up in the chat now, and I'll hand the microphone over to Dr. Okay, now I'm, I'm no longer just lip reading for me. You guys can actually hear me, hopefully. Can you? Looks like we're getting sound feed. So I'm Dr. Duke Majan, R. Duke Majan, CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. And for those of you who have not watched our surgeries, we stream every week, every surgery we do from our facility for the last seven years since we opened our doors. We've had zero surgeries that have been not transmitted over the internet live. So we do real-time reality TV for spine surgery. And what that means for the viewers is that you guys watching get, A, you get to watch spine surgery for free, which is we don't charge. B, you get to ask questions during the surgery. So if you see something, you want to know what are you, what are you doing over there? Why are you doing that? You can ask, why are you doing that? Um, usually I'll explain what I'm doing, but sometimes I get kind of caught up in what I'm doing or something else. So if you have a question, you're allowed to ask questions. Um, we don't charge for that either. Third of all, you get to watch a full spine surgery from beginning to end, unedited. Why is unedited important? Because it's transparency in medicine. We want you the audience, the world, to see inside an operating room what really happens. There are almost nobody in the world today and before today in the history of medicine has broadcasted live spine surgery every week, every surgery beginning to end. Sure, there have been one or two live surgeries here or there from some big institutions around the world, but Duke Spine Institute is the very first in the world the first facility in the world to broadcast all of our surgeries, to broadcast them live in real time, and to you know narrate each surgery as we're doing the surgery, and to answer questions from the audience in real time over, uh, over the internet and over the microphone. We're the first in the world to offer multi-view and integrated fluoroscopy, endoscopy, microscopy, eye in the sky, third person view, and first person view. And so if you're wondering why am I not seeing this elsewhere, because we are the only ones that do it. Uh, most surgeons don't want to broadcast their surgeries. They're afraid that if they make a mistake, everyone will see it. Um, I don't make very mis many, many mistakes, I just did now, but I don't make many mistakes in the operating room, which is actually good uh, for my patients, obviously. But the reality is, is that every surgeon has a different level of comfort doing surgery, and truthfully, every surgeon does surgeries differently. So why do we broadcast our surgeries? Well, we're doing it for a couple of reasons. Number one, we want everyone to have the ability to see what really happens in the operating room. We want everyone to see how good surgery is done to get good outcomes. So if you copy what I'm doing in your patients, if you're a surgeon, you're probably going to have excellent outcomes like we do. What are those outcomes that are so good? Well, number one, this patient anywhere else in the world would be in the hospital for three, or three to five days, okay? And when you're in the hospital three to five days, you have three to five days of exposure to getting infections from other patients, from other staff. You have risk of developing blood clots in your, le in your legs because, frankly, they just can't get you out of bed enough to get you moving around every day like you need to to get the blood circulating and prevent those blood clots. Uh, you can get pneumonia in the hospital. You get all kinds of mismanagement things that happen because let's face it, in the hospital you're being cared for by a lot of different healthcare providers and sometimes those healthcare providers make mistakes, right? We all know that mistakes are made in medicine. So when you're home in your own bed, healing on your own without healthcare providers, you're actually less likely to have a medical error made, right? Because after all, you're home. There's nobody there except you. So 
We've been doing this now seven years with outpatient fusions and outpatient s anterior cervical fusion, posterior cervical laminectomy fusion, lumbar decompression, thoracic, endoscopic surgery. We've had zero complications to date. That's zero. In seven years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of surgeries uh, for seven years with not a single complication. Incredible. Um, and that's all, all these surgeries are done outpatient, meaning people go home in two or three hours. So the laminectomy you just watched was a thoracic laminectomy. It was T9, 10, 11, and part of 12. You can see the screw in there, <coughs> which indicated basically the T11 pedicle. And we knew that the decompression needed to happen above and below that pedicle screw based on the MRI findings. Um, this is a complicated patient. They injured their back at work. They've had fractures. They have osteoporosis. They've had kyphoplasty. As a matter of fact, just below the screw were two vertebrae that had fractures with kyphoplasty. And I didn't do those today, but they were done in the, in the past. The point is, you're dealing with a patient with metabolic bone disease and degenerative conditions of the spine and instability. This patient had really bad scoliosis before, which I fixed. Uh, and now he's got adjacent segment disease. I don't know what he did to get that, but I can tell you he did something he wasn't supposed to do. He was doing some kind of lifting or twisting, and he admitted to me that he was, he said in his words, more active than he should have been after his back surgery. So unfortunately, he's got um, collapsing of the two discs above, which we had to do a laminectomy for. I also threw in a fusion, a non life fusion, because truth is is that th he didn't need instrumentation because he wasn't unstable enough his s bones weren't moving that much above the fusion but I wanted to kind of stabilize the spine after that much material and after what I saw with the rotation so I threw in some bone graft bone graft only fusions are the worst of fusions they have the least likelihood of working but it, they work 50% of the time so we have a 50 50 chance it'll heal and it'll stabilize well with just an only fusion Overall, I was very happy. You can see there was a lot of scar tissue on the dura. That's from the uh, inflammation on the dura from the, basically, the arthritis of the spine, for lack of a better word, inflammation on the spine with the ligament, the facets, the disc, all causing, basically, scarring of the dura, which is why it had that really weird reddish-gray appearance. It was all scar tissue and blood vessels feeding the inflammation. So... Um, I think he's going to do well. I mean, we saw during surgery with the intraoperative monitoring, which I do during this type of surgery with SSCP, motor evoke potential, and EMG, we actually could see that the SSCP waveforms improved 20% on one side and 40% on the other with the decompression. So that's actually a good sign. Uh, in about an hour, the patient will be awake and will know how he's doing. Um, yeah, that's about it. I think overall went well. We do have another surgery today. It's a Duke laser disc repair, single level L45 for herniated disc in the lower back with back pain. And our patient is from Canada. Uh, traveled all the way here. He's a farmer. And uh, they brought me some honey from their farm, which is really good, by the way. Um, so he's having horrible back pain, a little bit off to the left side. No leg symptoms. So we're going to try to get rid of his chronic back pain with a laser surgery. I think that's about it, Sean. Any questions?